This session will go to, um, oh. One, um, one hour? Yes, uh, it took an hour and a half to 10.30. Okay, what you have. Okay. Well. <clears throat> Let me uh, do as I did again la last night, begin with a uh, devotional, and we will read from Hebrews chapter 11, and beginning with the section dealing with Moses, verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months by his parents, because they saw he was a goodly child. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to share ill treatment with the people of God, God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, accounting the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. For he looked unto the recompense of reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood and the destroyer of the firstborn, uh, that the destroyer of the firstborn should not touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians saying to do, uh, us saying to do, were swallowed up. And then it begins with Joshua and the, and the fall of, of Jericho immediately following that. So one of the things to, I think that's striking is the writer of the Hebrews sees all of those activities of Moses as uh, being involved, his first there, the results of his faith. It is his faith, trusting in God, and then he acts. And there you have, in a sense, this thing that we were talking about last night, the distinction and yet the correlation of, on the one hand, our, our commitment to God in faith, justification, salvation comes, and then the growth and the obedience that grows out of that in sanctification. They must be there. And if you don't have sanctification, then you don't have justification. And yet we, and it's very difficult, and this is one of the places where the, it's difficult to, t to make that distinction, uh, that it's justification by faith alone, but that faith never stands alone. It's always going to produce the good works. And so uh, it's that, I think, especially that we'll see in Moses, and, and we do see in these, these passages that we've just read. Again, let us ask God's blessing. Our Heavenly Father, as we open thy word again, we pray for the guidance of thy spirit, that he may direct us, that what is spoken here be true to the word and be useful to each one of us in our lives. Guide us and be with us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I asked the pastor if it would be all right to talk a little bit about covenants. In a sense, we're going to start talking about Moses here. And, and you need to get the perspective of where he was in the whole biblical history. And our covenant theology, as we speak of it, Reformed uh, faith is, involves covenant theology, not only involves the five points of Calvinism, but it, it's the embracing of all that the Scripture teaches, including this whole theology of the covenants. Uh, in a way, it's hard to understand why dispensationalism uses dispensations to divide the history, very similar divisions of the history of the Bible, but why they call them dispensations? Why don't they go straight to the Bible, which t uses the, this distinction of covenants all the way through? Uh, it seems to me that's so clearly written on the face of it. But somehow they've gotten off into that particular definition of things and then define everything by way of dispensation instead of covenants. I'm not here to critique dispensationalism today particularly, but it is to me a sort of a, a strange thing that they uh, have gone in that direction. But uh, as we understand it, now the covenant of works then was, would be the Adamic covenant, the covenant in which he is told not to eat of the tree, the probation that we talked about last night, and it would, he would have earned the continuance in life, the eternal life, and the godliness, in other words, being confirmed in godliness in that new life, uh, continuing life, uh, had he obeyed. 
There's an interesting development or, or proposal that's suggested by Thornwell, who was a, a Southern Presbyterian theologian in the middle of the 19th century, and also by Candlish of the Free Church in Scotland, that Adam, as first created, was God's creature, and therefore his servant, but not a son. And on the basis of the comparison with what you get in the gospel, we are adopted into the family of God as we come to the gospel and receive Christ. We are justified and adopted. And it was Thornwell's view that had Adam kept the covenant, he would have been adopted as a son. Now those who would argue against him would say, well, but the genealogies carry it back to Adam, the son of God. And they say the language there. But actually, the, the Greek in that case is, is, an, is descendant, in a sense, rather than son, necessarily. It's not necessarily using that language of son. Uh, but it's generally translated in our English translations. Each one is the son of the one before, and so forth. But, uh, and so Girardot, who was uh, Thornwell's successor at Columbia Seminary, differed with his mentor. But it's very interesting to me that two of the professors, at least at Louisville Seminary, which was associated with the Southern Church at that time, uh, did adopt Thornwell's view. And I'm inclined towards Thornwell's view personally, uh, though I would not make a, 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 a terribly strong case for it. There were two books published in Scotland under the same title, one by Candlish, who was the free church man, you know, talk, talking about the fatherhood of God, and he talk, argued the same argument that Thornwell argued. Adam was not a son, would have become a son had he kept the covenant. And then by a man named Crawford, the, and the title of his book is The Fatherhood of God, and Crawford argued for the universal uh, sonship of all men. And the danger, perhaps Candlish saw this, the danger of that kind of thinking is what we've gotten into in the 20th and now in the 21st century. You see, uh, uh, von Harnack, the German theologian, the beginning of the 20th century said, what is the essence of Christianity? Fatherhood of God, brotherhood of man. That's literalism. That's modernism. That's become, in a sense, the religion of America. All of us are the children of God and we ought to act like brothers to with each other. And there's no, no gospel there. No salvation. No redemption. All of us are the children of God. I can remember liberal Southern Presbyterian minister, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, uh, at, at his dinner table saying, you didn't need a savior. God, God's not going to send his son to hell. You're one of the children of God. You're a fatherhood of God, brotherhood of man. And so you didn't need uh, somebody to die for you. It's a direct denial of the gospel. And it may well be that Candlish saw that. And uh, I don't think Thornwell necessarily lived. He died in 1862. So he may not have seen that coming. But Candlish lived beyond that. He may well have seen that coming. It's certainly uh, one of the problems that you get into if you hold to the universal fatherhood of of all, all men, that then you, in a sense, deny the doctrine of adoption. And uh, they, for us, this fatherhood of God is a tremendous blessing. The, the adoption, the doctrine of adoption is a tremendous blessing. But if everybody's a child of God, then this is not particularly unique. But that's sort of on the side. But the covenant of works then, and with the fall of Adam, he became a covenant breaker and in, this, in a sense, no longer able to keep the covenant of works. Now, the obedience that that re covenant required is still incumbent upon us. I used to have, have, my brother, younger brother, used to ask the preacher when we were still children, how can you be saved? And Mr. Moore said, keeping God's law. And Rock said, I can't do it. Or receive the law kept for you by the Lord Jesus. And, and the penalty that he's paid for your sins. And in a sense, the covenant of works, that obligation of obedience, is still in effect upon all men. And we certainly see the effects of the covenant of works uh, uh, on us. Death. Adam died, and now child is born and dies. He's Adam, the effects of Adam's sins are imputed to even children before they, they sin themselves. And so we're all subject to the death penalty. We're, in a sense, all dying already. Our, our bodies are all moving to aging and so forth. And I can t attest to that. I'm not able to do the things I was able to do when I was 50 or when I was 30 or 20. 
uh, and at the age of 80, you, you, you begin to lose some of the things. But the body is in that process of dying, really, uh, physically. Uh, of course, if you uh, go out of this life in the spiritual death, then you go into eternity without Christ. If you receive Christ during this life, then you can go into eternal life. And we'll be talking about that as we go along. So, the fall of Adam, then he became a covenant breaker, and in, in a very real sense could never again keep that covenant. And so God entered in, as we talked last night, Genesis 3.15, the announcement of victory over Satan with, through the seed of the woman. And I suggest that the covenant of grace is, begins at that point. It's not set, set forth in terms of covenant, but uh, the, the fact is that here's the gospel being announced, and the grace is, is uh, under the gospel of Christ. Now, you have the Noahic covenant, Genesis 9, after they come out of the flood. And uh, God is in that passage making provision for man's life. Provision for food in addition to the vegetable life. Uh, we, we, we eat flesh as well. And then the punishment of animals that kill a man. And the punishment of man who kills a man. And the ground for capital punishment is right there. That whosoever sheddeth a man's blood... His blood shall be shed. Why? Because man was made in the image of God. And the grounds for capital punishment is not that you're going to deter other murderers. That may well be that that'll be part of the benefits of it. But the ground is a man, when he's attacked somebody, has attacked the image of God. And it's against God that man has sinned in that way when he murders somebody. And the death penalty is the just desert according to God. And the establishment you remember prior to this, uh, God had said with regard to Cain, don't kill him. Didn't give human society the right to kill him. Now, in a sense, the establishment of the power of the sword, civil government. And Paul, in, in Romans 13, still talks about civil government and the power of the sword, so that the civil government has the power of life and death over us. Policemen in this country carry guns. If we are resisting to the point that they were endangering lives, we may be shot on the street by a civil magistrate. And so civil government's given the power of the sword right at this point. And the whole rest of the culture under which we are living, we are the descendants of Noah. We are first of all descendants of Adam, but then we're cutting off of everybody with that one family. We're now also the descendants of Noah, and we live under that order. Now, the Abrahamic covenant, the call of Abraham, Though there were people of God earlier, they had not been separated as a separate people. In the Abrahamic covenant, a number of the theologians speak of the Abrahamic covenant as being the charter of the church visible. That that's when you have this separate people being called apart separately from the rest of the world. And God saying, I'll be a God to thee and to thy seed, to Abraham. And Paul seeing that, and saying, if you're Christ, then are you Abraham's seed? So all of us spiritually are Abraham's seed uh, if we are Christ's. And so the, it is that distinction of this group of people from the world. So it, it is the charter of the church visible being established under the Abrahamic covenant. And the, uh, the, the, I, I cited, cited Genesis 17, 7, where it says, I will give God to thee and to thy seed after thee. It's very interesting, the end of the book of Revelation What's going to be the condition of the future state? You know, no uh, sun in the, in the new heavens and the new earth because God will be there. And what's going to be? God will be their God and they shall be his people. It's a citation right back to that Abrahamic covenant. The final consummate state is the fulfillment of that Abrahamic covenant. Now, the, uh, following that, then you'll have the Mosaic covenant and uh, with, with a great emphasis upon the law. But I would submit to you also that there is part of the law is the priesthood and the sacrificial system and the temple or the tabernacle and then later the temple. That the law here was a perfect standard, a reminder in a way of the original, but it's not putting men back under that covenant of works, but it is a reminder of the requirement of perfect obedience. And then when you fail to perfectly obey, here's how you approach God. 
through the sacrificial system, through coming to the tabernacle and, and offering your offerings. And the priest then carries that blood on in to the, on the Day of Atonement all the way into the Holy of Holies, which is the throne room of God. So in a sense, that represents how a sinner can approach God. And so it's gracious. I think I'm, I would make the point that if you look at the Ten Commandments in, in the opening statement with regard to it, the preface of the Ten Commandments is uh, that God is our Savior already. I am Jehovah thy God who brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Genesis, or Exodus 20, verse uh, 2. He's already our Savior and the Israel's Savior. I'm, your, I'm the God who has redeemed you. I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt and, and uh, I am therefore your Savior. This is how I would have you live. It's not a way, not a means by which they were to become God's people, but rather it's saying, I am your God, you are my people. This is how I would have you to live for me as my people. So the law was never set or given essentially as a means of how to become God's people, but it was given to people that were already called by God to be his people. And, uh, that, and it does have this provision, and I think very significantly, the provision of the priesthood and the sacrifices, all of that's part of the law. Not just the Ten Commandments. That's not the only part of the law. But all of these other things are part of the law as well. And so I think we need to see the law in that perspective. Now, dispensationalism tends to say that the Mosaic Law was a new dispensation of having to keep the law for salvation. That was a pharisaical misunderstanding of the law. And that's what Paul is arguing against when he says, man shall not be justified by his works. That's the pharisaical understanding. They would be justified by their works. And uh, you see, that's a misunderstanding of the law. Now, it is interesting. At the time of the, the establishment of the law, you have the provision for kings established. Uh, in, the, in that provision in Deuteronomy 17, actually speaks about the kind of, of kings and kind of, of, of treatment that they ought to have and that they should read the law and keep it all their lives. And uh, you have the provision for the theocracy then of, of the nation. And uh, I, I just would read from seven, Deuteronomy 17 verse 18. It shall be when he, that is the king, sitteth upon the throne of this kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book, out of which uh, that which is before the priests of the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear Jehovah his God, to keep his wor the words of this law and these statutes, to do them, that his heart not be lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not from, aside from the commandment to, this, to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Now, as you study the history of Israel, after, after Solomon, you have the splitting of the kingdom and the failure of this people to keep God's word. Israel, the northern kingdom in particular, set up new places of worship, set up a new priesthood, a new order and so forth, new religion essentially. And God caused them to be carried off into captivity under the Assyrians. And then Judah following along in suit. Uh, and eventually, the overthrow of both Israel and then of Judah as a nation, as a theocracy, because comes because of their failure to keep these statutes or even to make any effort really to keep them. They just, in a sense, ultimately rejected God, had become involved with pagan gods, spiritual adultery. And this is the thing that God keeps setting before them. Isaiah is especially strong in that, that. And keeps challenging them. Why do you worship this thing that you make a, an image and then you set it up and say this is the unmovable God? And how foolish that is. You've set it up there. And then you worship it as though it's unmovable. And uh, Isaiah 40 on, just constantly repeating that, that theme. And ultimately the theocracy fell because of the national rejection of God and of his law and uh, so it, it, you see that happening but God's dealing with his people did not cease and again Isaiah in particular verse chapters 40 on 
He says, you're going to be carried into captivity, but I'm going to bring you back. And ultimately it points to the Messiah and his work uh, as we are part of the recipients of that today. So the Mosaic order then, as we see, in a sense, the rest of the Old Testament is under the Mosaic order. Now you do have in 2 Samuel 7 the establishment of David's family and that there will be a one upon his throne forever. So they have the narrowing of the seed from the seed of the woman to the seed of Abraham to the seed of David. And from the Messianic prophecies after We haven't lost anything on the tape. All right. Uh, the, the messianic passages dealing with the, the uh, covenant with David, uh, they center on that after the, this announcement to the David. David. And you don't have, by the way, I mentioned it, this uh, Adam's covenant is not called a covenant. In 2 Samuel 7, it's not called a covenant. But you read Psalm 8, 89, and God says uh, that he has entered into a covenant with David. And so the idea of calling something a covenant that wasn't originally called a covenant, uh, we see it to be a, a scriptural case. And then the announcement by Jeremiah with the coming of the d destruction of, of, the night, of the theocracy, uh, Jeremiah is announcing there's going to come a new covenant. And that new covenant, of course, is fulfilled in Christ. And he's the fulfillment in the sense of all that has gone before in these earlier covenants, all the priesthood, the sacrificial system, all of that fulfilled in Christ as the new, in the new covenant. And the difference between the new and the old is the difference between the external where you had the law in the tables of stone. Now the Holy Spirit writes the law upon our hearts. Now it's not, it's true I think of the Old Testament saints true that they also had it written upon their hearts. But as a covenant it is this internalizing of it especially that is especially emphasized and the forgiveness of sins that is, is prophesied there. Total forgiveness in that. Now, to look at Moses himself. Voss, Gerhardus Voss, who was great system or a biblical theologian at Princeton, uh, he points out that Moses stands, in a sense, here between Abraham and Christ. That you, under Moses, the promises of this covenant that were given to him that he would become a nation, the father of a nation, and that they would enter into the land and have, possess a land. It's under Moses that this is going to begin to be fulfilled. Moses brings them to the edge of the, of the land, establishes them, uh, them as a nation with the giving of the law and so forth. Uh, this two million people that had come out of Egypt now being established for nationhood. Uh, that's one of the things that he does. So in a sense, he is the beginning of the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. And he himself is both the prophet to the people, and he is the priest to the people, and he is the king or sovereign over the people. And in that sense, he is the type of the Messiah. And uh, relatively few people had that. Samuel also had those three functions. Samuel was a priest, he was also a prophet, and he was the judge. He was the ruler over the people. And so uh, there are, are relatively few uh, people, but you do have the, the, these Moses in, in a very real sense being the prophet, priest, and king foreshadowing the Messiah. Now, as we look at the matter of salvation in the, in the Mosaic order, uh, as I say, the giving of the law is a re-emphasizing of the idea of the perfect obedience that is required. But ultimately, you find in the sacrificial system, when you are unable to keep that law, the provisions for salvation. And the sacrificial system, as I suggested last night, that what you have in the sacrificial system is a sinner comes and he wants to approach God and, and to commune with God. And because he's a sinner, he can't. So he brings the lamb as a substitute. And with in, in the book of Leviticus in the case of every sacrificial sacrifice except I think the trespass offering it is stated that he's to lay his hands upon the head of the animal 
and then he is to confess his sins over that animal. And yet you have the idea of the imputation of his sins to the animal. And the animal then must be slain immediately uh, after the, he becomes, as it, as it were, the animal becomes a sinner in the eyes of God. And his, the death penalty is upon him. And uh, you have that, that as a picture. Now, as, uh, in Leviticus 16, you have the description of the Day of Atonement in particular. And in, in the, on the Day of Atonement, which has just been celebrated, by the way, by the Jews just uh, about a week or two ago, uh, the Day of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is the day in which they, for once a year, there's a cleansing of the priesthood, of the high priesthood and the priesthood in general, and the cleansing of the temple itself for all the, the corruption that may have come to it with all these sacrifices brought into it. It's an annual cleansing of the whole and an annual cleansing of the people. And you have, first of all, Aaron has to offer sacrifices for himself. And then there are two goats that are made the, to, to, to a single sacrifice. Uh, one goat and they cast lots and let God determine which goat's to be killed and which is to be sent to the wilderness. And then the one goat he is to kill verse 15 of Leviticus 16 then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil now let me just pause again well a little bit of a, of a uh, offshoot you know we hold to we Presbyterians hold to the atonement being designed in particular for the elect sometimes called limited atonement better called particular or definite atonement I submit to you that every atonement in the Old Testament was definite. It was specifically for the individual bringing it, or in this case, it's for the nation, not for the whole world, but for the nation. Every atonement uh, in the Old Testament. And so you don't have a great strong defense of definite atonement in the New Testament. Why? Wow, you've had the whole history of 2,000 years of, of their sacrificing this way. And so uh, this was just a natural thing, thing as far as that goes. And so he was to kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his, go his blood within the veil and do with his blood as he did with the blood of the, the bullock, which was for himself. Carry it all the way in, sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and, and before the mercy seat and he shall make atonement for the holy place. And not only the people, but also for the holy place. He shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions, even all their sins. So shall he do for the uh, tent of meeting. The tent itself was to be thus sanctified and, and uh, atoned for. That dwelleth with, with them in the midst of their uncleanness. And, and you have then that uh, day of, of atonement required. In the verse 20, when he hath made an end of the atonement of the holy place, in the, in the tent of the meeting and the altar, he shall present the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over them all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions, even all their sins. And then notice the language in particular. And he shall put them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a man that is in readiness into the wilderness. You can't stay in the camp. Once this goat has become, as it were, the sinner, he must be taken out. And the provision was that he would be taken out to push over a cliff so he couldn't return, or taken far enough that he couldn't return, and then they would signal back by a semaphore in a way to the camp. He's been released. And then they would begin the next step of the burnt offering of celebration of the atonement that had been made. I think that the Psalm uh, 103 so beautifully describes this. Uh, this Psalm really is describing the plan of salvation in a, in a sense for us. Verse 11, For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward them that fear him. For as, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from, from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so Jehovah pitieth them that fear him. Uh, and that's a great comfort to us to realize that God has, as it were, removed 
our sins from us as the scapegoat carried that sins out of the camp, never to be returned. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. And that, you see, is what we believe takes place when we receive Christ as our Savior. And at that moment, he as judge says, this person is now pardoned of his sins. And the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. Our sins having been imputed to Christ as he went to the cross and he paying the penalty for them, now uh, we are judged to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ and God would declare this person is now saved. And the difference, one of you was asking me after the, the time last night, well, why is this different from a, a work? It was, it's the act of the judge a declarative act, not guilty, and he's righteous before this court. Uh, that, that's the emphasis of the, of the justification, a forensic judicial action. And by the way, adoption is the same way. Some of you have adopted children. I have two adopted children. When we went to the judge for one of the case of the first one, it was in New Orleans, by the way, and we hold a special place in New, for New Orleans in our hearts. Uh, because we got both of our adopted children there. Judge said to us, you really want to do this? He says, if you do, you can't break it. You can break your marriage, but we have no provision for you to break uh, uh, the adoption arrangement. And it, it was a judicial action of the court when they declared this child is now the child of these parents. And we see in, in, a, in the theology justification and adoption both to be forensic acts in which the judge on the one hand declares not guilty and righteous and on the other hand and I declare him now to be my son adopted into my family uh, theologians in the past uh, like Charles Hodge and even Dabney in, in the southern church treated adoption as part of justification Thornwell again as this theologian I mentioned earlier at Columbia Seminary saw the confession had a separate chapter. And so he began an emphasis on adoption as a separate uh, emphasis. And of course, this idea of adopt Adam being ultimately adopted uh, was part of his emphasis. So Columbia Seminary, in, in the, the course of, of history, Columbia Seminary uh, developed this doctrine of adoption more fully. And R.A. Webb, who was Girardeau's son-in-law, later taught at Louisville Seminary, but he wrote materials that was published after his death the Reformed Doctrine of Adoption. And Dr. Robinson, under whom I had sat uh, at Columbia Seminary, used to say adoption was a particular emphasis at Columbia Theological Seminary uh, that need, was needed. And I think that most of our schools now would celebrate or, or study adoption as distinct and separate from a, a justification. But you can see both were judicial acts, judged by a judgment of the court, and therefore, you could see how they could be sort of brought together as, as earlier theologians did. But I think it's appropriate to separate them as their Westminster standards do. Justification is one thing. Adoption is another thing. They go hand in hand together. But they are two different separate judicial or forensic actions by the court and by God as the judge. So you have then the, the Mosaic, in the Mosaic order, in particular the Day of Atonement, you have this idea of the sacrifice, the imputing of our sins to the sacrifice itself, and the sacrifice being offered in the stead of, as the substitute for the sinner. Now, one of the things modernists particularly objected to was this idea of substitutionary atonement, the, the so-called Auburn Affirmation that was made in 1923 uh, when, the, when the USA General Assembly was saying, at least these five essentials are necessary for, for all ministers to believe. Virgin birth, uh, the, the uh, vicarious atonement is one of those, uh, those essentials. Auburn Affirmations came and said, we, we think these are all good things, but not necessary for a Presbyterian minister to believe. And the result was the, the, the uh, Northern Church eventually went down the drain theologically. And... Uh, I, I can remember Dr. Lemon at, 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 at Ann Arbor, some of our intervarsity group who were out of the Northern Presbyterian Church, went over to, to the church and started talking to the assistant pastor about, what do you do about these passages about the blood of Christ? And finally, Dr. Lemon came in 
He heard that, heard that question. He says, I don't want any of that bloody carnage around here. He didn't believe the gospel at all. He wasn't a Christian. Presbyterian minister. And uh, th this, is, this is what occurred in the, in the northern church and then occurred in the southern church. The southern church is uh, a generation following uh, the northern church, slower to get to it, but, but as I said, chap minister at Chapel Hill, North Carolina, that I sat under, said, you didn't need Jesus as a savior. Fatherhood of God, brotherhood of man, you're all children of God. God's not going to send his child to hell. Didn't need a savior. And the denial of the gospel. Eventually, Charlie Jones was his name. He was forced out of the Presbyterian ministry. He wasn't actually brought, put under charges, but there was so much negative about him. Forced out of the Presbyterian ministry, and you know what happened? He turned around and joined the Unitarian Church. He didn't believe in the deity of Christ. He was a Unitarian minister in Chapel Hill. Stayed right there. And of course, you know what a community like that would do. They immediately elected him president of the of the ministerial association, showing their appreciation for his stand. And <laughs> but uh, uh, that, that's how that's how how bad it gotten in the old church. We in the PCA don't sense that sort of thing at this point. Those of you who, in a sense, have come to the PCA new, don't realize the kind of struggle that we were going against in the in the old Southern Church and the, in earlier under Machen in the old Northern Church. They don't realize how, how uh, what a struggle it is and was at that time. Basic denial of the gospel. Didn't want that bloody carnage. Uh, they didn't like that. It was a bloody religion. But you see, the wages of sin is death. And God said to Adam, the day you eat of it, you're going to die. And I think you see the evidence of his spiritual death immediately in his trying to hide from God. And... Uh, he needed, as, as uh, Jesus said to Nicodemus, Pharisee, you must be born again. You, before you can keep any, any law of God, you must be born again. Before you can even see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. The, the sinfulness of men uh, takes that requirement. And again, the child's catechism. And who can change the sinner's heart? The Holy Spirit alone. That's the work of God to give the rebirth. So you have then in this, uh, in, in the Mosaic economy itself, uh, these passages that are speaking to the matter of how a sinner can approach God in the sacrificial system. Uh, now, as, as under the Mosaic economy, you'd have other things as well. And I would suggest that we move over and look at, at passages such as uh, Isaiah chapter 45. And this is a very interesting chapter in that Isaiah in that chapter says of a pagan king that God has called him to be his servant. Uh, verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 45, Thus saith Jehovah to his anointed. That language, even Messiah, is what that language means. To Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue the nations before him that Cyrus was going to be the means by which Judah was going to the sins, or, or the people of Judah there in Babylon were going to be released and sent back out of their captivity. And God calls Cyrus uh, his anointed and his servant in this sense. Uh, but over in verses 24 and 25 of this chapter, only in Je Jehovah it is said of me is righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come, uh, and all they that are incensed against him shall be put to shame. So here's the challenge to the Israelites. If you won't come to, go, to Jehovah, in other words, you're, stay, you're worshiping these pagan gods, then you're going to be put to shame. It's only in Jehovah that you can receive righteousness. But here this concept that the righteousness that we have when we're justified, is God's righteousness. You see, again, you see, it's only in Jehovah. Uh, only in Jehovah, it said of me, is righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come. And all they that are incensed against him shall be put to shame. In Jehovah shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. So the true seed of Israel, those who come to Jehovah and, and put their trust in him, 
It's only in Jehovah that they shall be glorified. Now, that's language similar to what you have in, in uh, Paul's uh, re referring to the gospel and the, one of the benefits of the gospel of our union with Christ, that we were united to him in his crucifixion and in his burial and his resurrection, Romans 6, that we were in him. You see, it's in Jehovah shall all the seed of, of Israel be justified. And um, so that, that, that concept of the righteousness cut that comes to us as part of our justification is a ju righteousness that, that is Jehovah's righteousness. It's not our righteousness. It's the righteousness of Jehovah that's imputed to us. And it is in him only that we can be justified. Now the classic chapter, of course, with regard to the suffering of Christ, the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, the suffering servant, uh, beginning with verse 4, uh, where he is, he dis, he's been describing the servant in the verses just before that. Uh, verse 3, he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one from whom we men hid their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. We considered him probably under the proper wrath of God. And we didn't esteem him. And then Isaiah comes back in this next passage of this chapter and explains what was really happening. Surely he hath borne our griefs. Now, you can understand that, you see, from that picture of what, the, what does the priest do when he confesses the sins of the people over the goat or the lamb, of the lamb? He's putting those sins upon him. And here's Jesus represented as the Lamb of God. Surely he hath borne our griefs. Our griefs were put upon him. And we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. And that's what happened. As soon as he, our sins were imputed to him, he became the object of God's wrath. And here you have, the, of course, different persons of the Trinity, but God the Father representing the Trinity and God the Son in this case now having taken on our nature. God the Son is representing us. And when the God the Son receives those sins imputed to him, uh, then he is the object of the wrath of the Father for our sins. And you have in 2 Corinthians, of course, 